Welcome back to Court TV Live. We've been telling you we're going to take you out to that courtroom in Michigan for the tortured son murder trial. And Paul Ferguson is now in front of the judge. He entered the courtroom. He entered with his attorney. The judge entered the courtroom and proceedings began. We're going to take you back to that moment when the judge enters. So let's go out to that courtroom in Michigan. Before the court is filed, uh, 2022 FH, excuse me, FC, it's people of the state of Michigan versus Paul Ferguson. Are you Paul Ferguson, sir? Yes, sir. Mr. Ferguson, can you please rise and raise your right hand? In this matter now pending, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do, sir. Put your hand down and grab a seat. Mr. Ferguson is represented today by Mr. Joshua Eldon Brady. The people are represented by Ms., uh, Mr. Matthew Roberts. The date and time scheduled for a status conference on this case. Uh, the court's been informed that there, uh, there is going to be a plea. Is that correct, Mr. Roberts? Uh, yes, Your Honor. At this time, it is my understanding that Mr. Ferguson does intend to offer the court a plea to the charge of child abuse in the first degree. Uh, as the court is aware, the court presided over the trial last week of the co-defendant in this matter, Shonda Vander Ark. She was ultimately convicted by a jury of first-degree felony murder as well as first-degree child abuse. I did have an opportunity to speak with the jury after that as Mr. Ferguson was a witness in that case and testified for the prosecution. Uh, I can report to the court that after my conversations with the jury in this case, as well as uh, looking back over Mr. Ferguson's cooperation, it's my intention at this point that no additional charges will be filed against Mr. Ferguson uh, in exchange for him pleading here today to this charge of first-degree child abuse. That final decision was not made, however, I, I need to be clear about this until after consulting with the jury and, and certainly getting some input from the jury about Mr. Ferguson's testimony and what that meant ultimately in the case uh, against Shonda Vander Ark. Uh, it's my further understanding, and, and I've indicated this to the court in chambers, that as a result of the cooperation that Mr. Ferguson has provided and pursuant to the commitment that we made to inform the sentencing court yourself of his cooperation, that I will ask the court to impose, at the time of sentencing in this matter, impose a sentence within the Michigan sentencing guidelines for this offense. Obviously, that will go to the minimum offense, and then the court will still have to make a determination as to the minimum sentence, as well as the maximum potential, potential sentence. But I will ask the court to make a sentencing uh, commitment within those sentencing guidelines. It's my understanding the court at this point has not made any commitments in relation to any sentencing, uh, and that is my, simply my recommendation here with, those, uh, with the recommendation for a, a sentence within the sentencing guidelines, but the court has not yet committed to that at the, this point. All right, Mr. Eldon Brady, any comments uh, regarding Mr. Roberts' statements? I, I saw a little bit of questions. I just want to clarify the, the simple version of Mr. Roberts' statement. It's our understanding that the people's commitment is in exchange for Mr. Ferguson pleading as charged to the child abuse in the first degree that the people are committing that there will be no additional charges related to the same set of circumstances brought against him in this case and that the people will not ask for a sentence above the sentencing guidelines in this case, as well as continuing to fully and fairly inform the court of Mr. Ferguson's cooperation. All right. Uh, is that correct, Mr. Roberts? Yes, that's, that's what I indicated. All right. Uh, Mr. Ferguson, did you hear the statements that were made by both Mr. Roberts as well as your attorney, Mr. Alden Brady? Yes, Your Honor. Do you understand um, the terms of the agreement? Yes, Your Honor. Now, you need to understand, uh, although Mr. Roberts uh, is going to make a sentencing recommendation to the court to stay within guidelines, um, that is not binding upon the court. Do you understand that? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, uh, I have not committed to any particular sentence, and I told the attorneys essentially I'm not committing to stay with, even within the guidelines. There's a lot of things I need to see. Uh, in terms of a pre-sentence report and in terms of some information that Mr. Alden Brady in, intends to offer the court. But I want you to understand before we go on with this plea that there is no guarantee uh, that it would be within guidelines. You understand? Yes, Your Honor. Now, the court, uh, if it exceeded guidelines, all the guidelines are advisory. The court would certainly have to put grounds why it was uh, going outside those guidelines. Uh, but again, um, there's no guarantee. You understand? Yes, Your Honor. All right. And knowing all of that, you still wish to go forward with the plea? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Roberts, you can read the information. 
The information then would read that on or about July 6 of 2022 in the city of Norton Shores at 4788 Marshall Road in the county of Muskegon and in the state of Michigan, that Paul Ferguson did knowingly or intentionally cause serious physical harm to a child. Contrary to Michigan law, this charge is known as child abuse in the first degree. That is a felony. It is punishable by life or any term of years. All right, Mr. Ferguson, did you hear the prosecutor read the felony information? Yes, Your Honor. Do you understand the name and the elements of the offense that you face? Yes, Your Honor. You know, the offense you'd be pleading guilty to in count one is called child abuse in the first degree. That is a felony punished by up to life or any term of years. There's no mandatory minimum sentence you must serve. Do you understand? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, as of this charge, you have one of four plea choices versus a null contendory plea. It's commonly called a no contest plea. It's a plea where you choose not to fight the charge for record and sentencing purposes. It operates as a guilty plea. Second, you can plead guilty. Third, you can plead not guilty. And fourth, you can stand mute, which means you would not speak. And I would enter a not guilty plea on your behalf. Do you understand the four pleas? Yes, Your Honor. At sentencing, both you and your attorney will be given a reasonable opportunity to read a pre-sentence report and to make additions, corrections, or comments, and the court will pronounce your sentence. Are you prepared to enter a plea at this time? Yes, Your Honor. What is your plea to count one child abuse in the first degree? Guilty, Your Honor. Has anyone promised you anything else beyond the matters recited here today to get you to plead guilty? No, Your Honor. Anyone threaten you to plead guilty? No, Your Honor. It's pleading guilty of your own free choice. Yes, Your Honor. Right, your plea gives up all the rights listed on the advice or rights form that you signed. Uh, those rights include the right to a trial by a jury, the opportunity to do a trial by the court without a jury if you chose, and the prosecutor in the court agreed. You have the right to presume innocent until proven guilty, to have the prosecutor prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you are guilty, to have the witnesses against you appear at the trial, to question the witnesses against you, to have the court order any witnesses you have for your defense, to appear at the trial, to remain silent during the trial, to not have that silence used against you, and to testify at the trial if you wish to testify. Do you understand that uh, your guilty plea gives up these rights? Yes, Your Honor. Do you agree to give up those rights? Yes, Your Honor. Your plea gives up any claim that it was a result of a secret promise or a threat that was not disclosed to the court at this plea proceeding. It also gives up the right to claim later that it was not your own choice under the plea. Your plea changes your appellate rights from having the right to appeal to having to seek leave or permission to appeal to the Court of Appeals. Do you understand? Yes, Your Honor. To the attorneys, are either one of you aware any promises, threats, or inducements regarding the plea other than those already disclosed in the record, Mr. Roberts? No, Your Honor. And Mr. Eldon Brady? No, Your Honor. Mr. Eldon Brady, do you wish to client, uh, question your client regarding the factual basis for the plea? Yes, please, Your Honor. All right, you may proceed. Um, Mr. Ferguson, you heard the uh, information that was read by Mr. Roberts. Yes, Your Honor. First. And we just need a yes or no answer so it's clear for the record. You heard the information read by Mr. Roberts? Yes. And you heard the address mentioned in that information? Yes, sir. And from the start of 2022 until your arrest, uh, did you live at that address? Yes. And did your mother, Shonda Vander Ark, also live at that address? Yes. And did your younger brother, Timothy Ferguson, who was 15 years old at the time, also live at that address with you? Yes. All right, we're getting into the factual basis for the plea. This is all pretty typical when you have a guilty plea and the judge yes. informs the defendant of the rights. How do you want to plead? He did a guilty plea to first-degree child abuse, but he still stands to serve up to life in prison. Yeah, I mean, I'm not exactly sure of the guidelines for a first-time offender in this situation. Uh, it seems to suggest that that's still the range mm -hmm. that the judge can uh, consider. And he was clear to him saying, look, I'm not bound by the recommendation by the prosecutors. This little deal between them was that we won't add any more charges based on your testimony, right. and we will recommend within the guidelines. You know, you can downward depart, you can upward depart, et cetera, et cetera. Judge said he's not bound by that. So it was a little scary for him, I'm sure. Um, but he's taking this plea, and he's going to uh, uh, roll the dice with the judge. Judge has to get more information on him. Um, and boy, I have no idea where this one might land. I don't either. In the pre-sentencing report, and I can imagine there are going to be some psychological evaluations so the mm -hmm. judge can be fully informed yes. before imposing that sentence. We're going to hit the pause button so that you're going to hear all of the factual basis for this guilty plea. Stay tuned. Court TV, your front row seat to justice. 
Coming soon to Court TV. These murders have shaken our community. Why did you do it? The doomsday prophet, Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty against him. A social media sensation, now a suspected killer. Karen Reed, she's accused of murder. She says she's the victim of a police cover-up. It's scary just knowing that he was so close. The high-stakes trials you don't want to miss. Coming soon, only on Court TV. Welcome back. Our breaking news, Paul Ferguson has just pled guilty to first-degree child abuse in the death of his special needs brother, Timothy. Now, this comes after his mother was convicted last week in that same child's death. Right now, we want to get you back into court in Michigan to hear the factual basis of the plea. And as far as you're aware, that uh, house is located within Muskegon County, correct? Yes. And at some point during that time period, did Shonda Van Der Ark give you instructions um, that you were only supposed to feed Timothy bread with hot sauce or sometimes plain bread and, and no other food? Yes. And did Shonda Van Der Ark either instruct or ask you to look after Timothy while she was at work? Yes. Was it your, or did you follow that instruction to feed him only bread with hot sauce or plain bread? Yes. And was it your understanding that uh, Ms. Van Der Ark was following the same food limitations for Timothy when you were at work and she was there? Yes. And was there a point uh, approximately three weeks before Timothy's death that you realized that that very limited diet was having a serious effect on his health and weight? Yes. And did you communicate that to Ms. Van Der Ark? Yes. And on that day, she allowed you to feed him an ad additional food. Yes. But after that, she went back to the instruction of only bread with hot sauce and bread. Yes. And did you follow that instruction? Yes. And your understanding was she was still similarly limiting his food intake when you were not present? Yes. Um, the night before your brother Timothy died, did Shonda Van Der Ark give you an instruction that you were to put him in the bathtub with water and ice? Yes. And did she give you further instructions about keeping him in the bathtub until she returned from work? Yes. And did you follow those instructions? Yes. Okay, the only question I had, Mr. Ferguson, was um, Timothy under the age of 18? Yes, Your Honor. All right, any additional questions, Mr. Roberts? I believe that's a f sufficient factual basis to establish the plea, Judge. All right. Uh, the defendant offers the court a plea of guilty to the offense of child abuse in the first degree. His testimony establishes that he committed this crime that, well, I should ask you, Mr. Ferguson, this, this home at 4788 Marshall Road, is that in the county of Muskegon, state of Michigan? Yes, Your Honor. So uh, his testimony now establishes that he committed this crime, that he committed this crime in Muskegon County. The court finds the plea to be knowing, voluntary, and accurate, and for all those reasons, the court accepts the plea. For the attorney, says the court comply with MCR 6.302B through D regarding the taking of pleas, Mr. Roberts? Court yes, Your Honor and Mr. Eldon Brady. I believe so, Your Honor, thank you. All right, Mr. Ferguson, do you have any questions about anything we've done here today, sir? No, Your Honor. The court's gonna refer the matter to state probation for preparation of a pre-sentence report. Schedule sentencing for January 29th, 2024 at 8.30 a.m. Uh, bond at this time is uh, revoked. Mr. Uh, Ellen Brady, I know there was some discussion about um, getting a potential assessment on your client, and um, obviously that that's, could take a little bit, especially over the holidays. So if for some reason uh, you need additional time, just let the court know and certainly accommodate that. I, I do want as much information as I can about your client. Um, so if that will help the court, I want you to be able to, to have the time that's needed to do that. Uh, beyond that, anything else for the record, Mr. Roberts? I'm sorry, did you say January 24th? Obviously. 29th. 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 Thank you. 29th. Nothing so, thank you. All right. And any other, anything else, Mr. Ellen Brady? No, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. We are adjourned. Have a good holiday. All right. So the plea agreement done, his allocution in court done. Um, January 29th is the date set for his sentencing, giving a little over a month for the defense to put together some information about this defendant to give to the judge to help him make his decision as to the ultimate sentence in this case. Judge, what was interesting was um, prosecutors allowed the factual basis to be 
Mom instructed him to do everything. Mm -hmm. All the acts that led to the death, we know that the cause of death was starvation. So all the acts that led to the starvation, were in, he was instructed by his mom. That's the way they did the factual basis of this. I thought that was interesting. I noticed that too. Every way that it was worded and his mm -hmm. attorney, I'm sure, carefully crafted those yes. words yes. to make clear that he acted only on the instruction of and the mom. mother yes. to mistreat and abuse his brother Timothy. Yeah, and prosecutors were okay with it. Yes. Because prosecutors could certainly object to that. That's fair. All right, let's bring in uh, our guest still with us, trial attorney Michael Jaffer. Michael, um, we've talked about this ad nauseum, uh, what was going to happen. Um, your thoughts on what we saw in court today? Uh, I was I was a little bit surprised. I'll be honest with you. Uh, yeah, I agree that the factual basis was very uh, very favorable to him. Looking forward to the sentencing, but I was surprised that there was not a reduction. That there was not some sort of a plea agreement on on that would that would tend to say this is what you're looking at and uh, you know the uh, the maximum sentence. I, I was I was surprised by that because had it not been for this kid, the mother would not have been convicted. There wouldn't have been enough evidence. The video was bad, but the text messages were, were nothing, right? It was his testimony, and he, he he leaned into getting his mom convicted. He did the right thing. I was a little bit surprised by that because now it's in the hands of this judge. This judge is a good judge, um, but uh, the pre-sentence investigation report, the, the health evaluation, the mental health evaluation that they're going to submit to this judge, this judge could sentence him to 20 years. He could sentence him to more, he could sentence him obviously to a lot less, but uh, I was surprised by that. His attorney, by the way, is a good attorney. So I have to assume, I have to assume that they did the best they could and that was the best they, they could have. There have been cases I've been involved in where if you were looking at the case from the outside, you would have said, why would that attorney let that let, let his client testify or do something? And what they don't know behind the scenes is, it's not really up to the attorney a lot of the times. Clients make these decisions. I have to assume that this, defendant wanted this to happen this way and it's not that that's the best that his attorneys could have done for him i just have to assume that because again that attorney is a good attorney he would have done the best he possibly could given the circumstances and i think the biggest circumstance he had to deal with was his own client's wishes on how he wants the next five ten years of his life to go yeah, and yeah. I too said, I can't believe they didn't agree to some number of years or a mm -hmm. range of years. I thought the exact same thing. But the other thing is, maybe they couldn't come to an agreement on that and said, okay, we're going to have to leave it up to the judge. But I agree with you. Whatever they did, the defendant had to sign off on, which he did. Here's what I want to ask you. I thought it was truly in the best interest of this child, who although an adult I think of as a child, and really for justice, that the prosecutor said, I spoke to that jury mm -hmm. who did convict Shonda, and I talked to them about Paul's testimony to get their opinion of Paul's testimony I think that was brilliant because it gave it so much feedback I'm sure as to the credibility or not of Paul's testimony Michael oh absolutely and by the way that was a great and I saw the interview of the of the prosecutor at the day after the the, the trial um, that's what they that's what they call turning over every stone and looking underneath it and really caring about your crap that prosecutor is a seasoned prosecutor he's been around for a long time People don't understand. Prosecutors don't make a lot of money. For you to have white hair and still be a prosecutor trying these types of heinous cases, you know a lot. You're very experienced. You are you are a grizzled, experienced attorney. So for him to ask the jury before they came to into this week was a veteran move. Uh, and it was a veteran move that allows him to basically put this case behind him. Now it's out of the prosecution's hands, right? The prosecution can come up, they can look at the pre-sentence investigation report, obviously, in Michigan and give their their opinion to the judge. But really, it's just them giving their opinion. It's up to the judge now. But uh, they've done their homework and they have, yeah, you're right, Judge Ashley, talking to the to the, to the the jur juries and asking them, hey, what was your opinion? What was your impression? I'm telling you, my impression, my impression is that had it not been for Paul Ferguson, I don't think we would see a conviction of Shanda. I mean, it, it, it was powerful. You know, that's a consideration. But you know what's also a consideration for the defense is there's a trial tax. We all know it. 
there's a trial tax. When you take a case to trial, you know that they're going to ask for more mm -hmm. than they would if you agreed to a plea. So even if you don't know the years, you know you're going to get less than if you go to trial, right? And the likelihood of conviction here is good. Yeah. So a plea makes sense to me. I want to quickly listen to an aspect of this young man that may come into play. We're going to hear more about it. Actually, we don't have time for that right now, but it, it really involves the Stockholm Syndrome. This idea that he was acting because of the situation he was in with this woman and a number of other mental health issues that may come into play. So I would imagine, Michael, that's going to be a big part of the consideration for the judge in determining sentence here. Absolutely. I mean, you look at this kid and the, the, the ideology is when you have mental health issues or any type of autism, you're like an infant, right? You 19 going on 12. And he self-diagnosed himself by saying, maybe I have Stockholm syndrome. It, I kind of I kind of agree with him. Uh, but it's absolutely gonna, gonna, gonna play a big part uh, in the way that this judge sentences, absolutely. And I would want an assessment, psychological assessment of my client. It can go both ways, so that mm -hmm. might hurt you, but I think at the end of the day, in a case like this, where he mm -hmm. did things at the um, obvious, at the direction of his mother, that there's some real issues there from his childhood. All right, thank you, Michael Jaffer, for joining us this hour.